loud and clear. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, hey, yeah, guys, I'm sorry for the delay. We we have this new computer we've been finicking with, and we're trying to trying to see if we can get it to work because we have three monitors running in here. But uh, anyway, we're going to go back to the old school way, which is the way we were doing it before, and we'll just get it done that way. So nonetheless, I'll give everybody a couple minutes to go from the the old stream that was there to come into the new stream and um, and then we'll get started what are we talking about we're talking about auto thrust on the 320 we're talking about engine failures on the 73 and then we're going to talk about unusual attitude so we got a lot of stuff we got a lot of stuff to talk about and um, and then of course whatever whatever you want to uh, hear us talk about just drop it in the in the chat there and hopefully we'll get it answered Hopefully we'll get it answered. I don't have the answers for everything, <laughs> but I'll do my best to answer what I can. All right, let me get this Instagram going. How are you all doing? How's the quarantine going? Are you guys, are you guys flying? Are you not flying? Are you on a leave? Are you not on a leave? I am genuinely curious. I read yesterday, at least in the U.S. I don't know about abroad, but we we surpassed a million passengers through TSA checkpoints for the first time I think since March that's a pretty big um, accomplishment you know so I'm happy to see that I'm personally on a leave I fly again next year January and we're taking the time to record new stuff here man there's there's a lot of stuff we've been doing I'm gonna share it with you I'm gonna share it with you here um, and then in December we're gonna be doing a two-day event virtually as well that I think will be of interest for you all so I'll share that with you also. All right, let's get Instagram up. My peeps on the Insta Instagram arama. Can you all? Um, because we went back to the old method, I uh, I don't have my multi monitor set up. So I'm hoping you guys can still hear me. I guess I can ask Shally. Do they still hear us? They see us. They. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, cool. So let's do this. Let's just put this live right here. Bam. We got Instagram. Is this your water or is this mine? That's mine. Okay, here. It's okay. I gotta get it Don't worry about it. Uh, all right, peeps. We're going to talk auto thrust. We're going to talk engine failure. And we are going to talk, what did I say? Unusual attitude. Another couple minutes or so, and we will get get going. Leave your questions in the comments. Leave your questions in the comments. Tosin, loud and clear, what's going on, baby? Francis, clear, what's up, Francis? What's up, IG? We got you on the stream over here. Let me put up on the board what we're talking about. Somebody, um, I got actually quite a few questions that came in this time around. Uh, let's see what we got. Maybe I'll pull some of those up from my email too, depending on time. All right, auto thrust, engine failures. Uh, we may do the unusual attitudes, but I'm gonna. I want to actually look at. Uh, there's a really good question that came in on my email, so I'll see if um, I'll see if we want to talk about that, and maybe we'll do that. And what else? What's up, IG? If you are on Instagram and you want to watch the, uh, the YouTube, just go to our YouTube, OneStepPrep.com. I'm all mic'd up. Apologize for the delay, folks. Like I said earlier, we've got uh, a new setup and we're kind of working the kinks out of it. But nonetheless, we're here and we're going to get to it, okay? So look, um, happy Wednesday wherever you are right now. Hope you and your family are doing well, particularly during these times. Hope your flying's going well. Maybe you're flying or maybe you're not. And if, at the very least, if you're not, I hope you're studying. And I hope you're staying sharp and you're staying up to date on everything. Pilot Eyes, what's going on? Jax, what's going on? Watching on the treadmill. She's getting her exercise in, okay? That's one thing I've been doing throughout this quarantine, staying fit, okay? A lot of people, maybe they're not, they're eating, but I'm, I'm trying to stay fit. Smile for the camera. Shally's taking pictures. Okay, thank you. All right, so first topic, first topic, first topic. 
is the auto thrust. Um, I want to talk a little bit about auto thrust. I'm going to talk about the active range of the thrust levers. I'm going to talk about where it gets its signal from. Uh, then we'll move into the engine failure. Somebody asked us on Instagram yesterday, <laughs> kind of a, a crazy question. What happens if I get a dual engine failure at V1? And then they also went on to elaborate. Maybe you're watching right now if you were the one that asked this. Um, what happens if you get a dual engine failure at 35 feet? And they fly the 737, uh, or at least I think they do. So anyway what happens is basically you're out of thrust man you're out of power <laughs> okay but i'm going to expand on that because there's a checklist for loss of thrust on both engines and uh, i do want to kind of uh, expand on that checklist a little bit okay so let's talk about the auto thrust for the 320 drivers if you're a 73 driver and, and i realize uh you know we kind of we cover both because we teach both here i'm going to try to hit both so stick with me boeing stick with me 73 guys don't leave me okay so auto thrust on the a320 Active range is just above idle, up to and including the climb detent. Now, just above idle, up to and including the climb detent. This is two engines. This assumes two engines. It changes, what I'm actually going to do here is let's put two engines here. Because this, this is going to change if you're single engine, right? So now if I'm single engine, I can get all the way up to the flex MCT. Let's write it down here and keep it consistent. Flex MCT if I am with one engine. Now, the FMA tells the story, as I always say. Auto thrust is column one. So on takeoff, you'll see either man flex or you'll see man toga. It, it's regardless whether it's flex or toga. What's important is that it's manual. And you're in manual thrust. Now, the reason you're in manual thrust on takeoff is because you're taking off with two engines, right? We don't take off with one engine. So you're taking off with two engines, and the active range is only up to the climb. And, of course, you have the thrust levers either in the flex or in toga, which means you are outside of the active range, which means you are in manual thrust. And this is why you see man over here. Now you also have auto thrust in blue in column five, right? Is this five columns? Yeah. So you're. Yeah. Excellent connection. All right, we'll roll with it. Man, this internet, even on my phone, it's like slow. Does it show us still? Okay, ground speed mini. Still live in the 305. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, we're, 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 we're back, we're back. So where was I, man? Let me keep going with this, okay? Let me keep going with this. Active range and man flex auto thrust on the FMA with the auto thrust on the 320. Two engines, just above idle, back to climb, okay? This is your two engines. One engine up to flex MCT. So on takeoff, I was saying that on... Uh, takeoff your column one says manual because you're up here in the manual area outside of the active range and of course when you reach the thrust reduction altitude how do you know what your thrust reduction altitude is it's on your performance page uh, on the bottom of the perf page which pilot flying you should be taken off in the perf page right on the bottom of the perf page you will see thrust reduction slash acceleration now Column one flashes, lever, climb. It says lever, climb. You bring the thrust levers back to climb. Your auto thrust, blue, blue is, the color coding is very crucial in this aircraft, so the blue will disappear. It's going to go white. And, of course, when it goes white, it means that it's in an, it's an active mode now. So you're in the active range. 
Now, where does this auto thrust system get its inputs from? Okay? And f funny enough, okay, funny enough, in the initial training, I really emphasize this. We actually have two auto thrust systems. And most people are like, Joe, what do you mean we got two auto thrust systems? Because there's only one auto thrust push button on the FCU. Okay, so the second auto thrust, let's kind of draw that out. Let's expand this a little bit is the FMGC. See, your auto thrust works from FMGC number one and FMGC number two. FMGC one, and of course we've got two of them, right? FMGC stands for Flight Management Guidance Computer, if you're wondering. Okay, so the channel, there's two channels, right? That's really what it's called. There's two channels, auto thrust channel one or auto thrust channel two, it depends on which autopilot is on. So if autopilot one is on, FMGC one is commanding the auto thrust functions. And if autopilot two is on, FMGC number two is commanding the auto thrust functions. By the way, what if there's no autopilot on, then where is the FMGC getting its information from? It always defaults to, if you know it, leave it in comments. Leave it in comments if you know it. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Leave it in comments, Instagram. Carlos, thanks. Awesome classes. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Okay, it defaults to FMGC number one. So if there is no autopilot engagement, it will default to FMGC number one. Okay, now uh, the auto thrust system works with several other computers. So to name some, the FADEC is one. The ADIRS and the ECU slash EEC uh, engine control unit or electronic engine control. Actually, the EEC is also on the 737NG. It's very interchangeable terminology, if you will. But the basic function of this is that the Dependent upon the engine that you have, maybe you have an IAE or maybe you have the CFM, you're either commanding EPR or N1. And this is one of the questions that came in. What is the N1 rated versus unrated mode? Why don't you have auto thrust, etc.? So maybe I'll dive a little bit into that as well. Okay. But the, the, deal, the deal is this. You have a FMGC, Flight Management Guidance Computer, that works together with the probe, the P2 probe, that is sensing ambient temperature, ambient pressure, TLA, or thrust lever angle. Based on the thrust lever angle, okay, the FADEC knows what EPR or what N1 is desired. Let me say that again. Based on ambient temperature, pressure, altitude, and TLA, abbreviation for thrust lever angle, based on those conditions, the FMGC tells the FADEC that this is the desired EPR or N1 output. And to achieve the desired EPR or N1 output, the FADEC will talk to the ECU or the electronic engine control, which we'll bring ADRs into the picture in just a second, but it'll talk to the ECU or the EEC to give it the exact fuel flow needed to get the desired EPR or N1. So, so think about this. You have P2 probe TLA that generates a needed N1 or EPR value, dependent upon engine manufacturer, which later talks to the ECU to get an actual fuel flow amount so that we can actually get that fuel flow to the engine to deliver the desired EPR, which came from the thrust lever angle <laughs> back on the P2 probe, the ambient temperature pressure and altitude from, uh, and the TLA that was sensed via the thrust lever. So it's a, it's a relatively... Uh, complex yet simplistic depending upon how it's broken down but it's kind of a, a, a laundry list of things that goes into this and the FMGC channel 1 and 2 both crucial on this and one of the more common things that I like to, to, to point out of significance is the fact that you actually have two auto thrust channels and it's not a single one because it's easily confused via the one auto thrust switch now um, a little bit beyond the scope of this is the modes the automation modes uh, variable thrust, variable auto thrust modes versus variable uh, versus fixed, I should say, uh, thrust mode. So you have fixed thrust and variable thrust. What are those FMA modes? Certainly man is a fixed, speed is a variable, thrust climb, 
uh, thrust idle, those are all fixed modes. So there's actually other YouTube content on that. I won't waste any time talking about it, but that's a part of it as well. Now let's talk about this auto thrust ways to take it off. Let's talk about how it relates maybe to alpha floor. And then let's talk about the N1 rated versus unrated mode. So you have EPR up here. This is on the IAE, by the way. The IAE engine, typically we're in EPR mode. We're setting thrust according to EPR, right? It can then degrade into N1 mode. This is one of the questions that came in. Joe, what is the N1 mode of the auto thrust, right? And it goes into what's called a rated or an unrated. Now, if you're typically in EPR mode, the way that you degrade into rated or unrated N1 mode is if you lose an input to one of these computers. Perhaps you, the P2 is no longer sensing pressure, you're no longer sensing temperature. So you lose an input, and the next thing you know, the aircraft will go in, or the engine, I should specify, will go into one of these N1 modes via rated or unrated. What's the main difference? In rated mode, I have protection. This is the main difference, folks. And in unrated mode, I have no protection. No protection. So in other words, protection from what, Joe? What are you talking about? Protection from uh, excessive thrust. You could have an excessive uh, N1 value, an excessive uh, EGT value, temperature, in the, N, in the N1 unrated mode. In the rated mode, you are still protected. And the way to really think about this is, um, I think in the, the description I gave him in the email, I said, think of this as safe mode in your computer. You have some functionality, but not all. If you start your computer in safe mode, can you run your computer? Yeah, but you lose some of the functionality, right? So N1 mode, on an IAE engine is very similar in that you still have perhaps protections or you don't you still have much of the functionality but you lose some of the functionality and some of the functionality that you're going to lose if it's not only a protection is you're certainly going to lose on both of these you're going to lose auto thrust so in the N1 mode you will not have auto thrust auto thrust is gone why don't you have auto thrust because you've lost inputs you've lost inputs that are crucial to auto thrust being able to accurately calculate a desired EPR or N1 value. EPR is what we're talking here on the IAE. So you're going to go down into this uh, N1 protected or rated or unrated, which is basically protected or a non-protected mode. How do you know um, if you have IAE engines immediately just by looking at the overhead panel? And frankly, the way to know is look at the overhead panel on the right side. You should see two push buttons for N1 mode. If you don't see the N1 mode, you likely have the new, newly installed, if you will, CFM engines that are always setting thrust according to N1 as opposed to EPR anyways. So one of the easiest things you can do, those of you that are not sure, look at your overhead panel on the aircraft you fly. And do you have an N1 mode push button or not? If you don't, you got a CFM, and if you do, you get an IAE that could degrade into a rated or an unrated mode, keeping in mind you will never have auto thrust. What are some other ways that you're not going to have auto thrust? One, of course, if it's MEL, the FMGCs don't work. Perhaps you, you are in this N1 mode, or perhaps you intentionally disconnect it, which you could intentionally disconnect your auto thrust indefinitely. How? Push the instinctive disconnect push button and hold it for 15 seconds. The IDPs, instinct, I don't know why they call it such a long, instinctive, disconnect push button, man. Why, why is it such a long, why not just say the red button, brother and sister, the disconnect button. So you push it and you hold it for 15 seconds, and that will e effectively remove your auto thrust system for the remainder of the flight. And by the way, not only will it rem remove your auto thrust, it will also remove the alpha floor functionality of the auto thrust system because alpha floor, of course, needs auto thrust, right? So another thing that comes up then is, man, why would I want to indefinitely remove my auto thrust system? And perhaps it's because you are stuck in a alpha floor loop. What? What does that mean? Well, what is alpha floor, right? It's basically a protection that is provided in normal law assuming auto thrust is functional, functional, available, it doesn't have to be on, just assuming that it's available, where it will command toga power if a low energy 
situation is predicted. Low energy situation predicted, not that you're in it, that it's predicted. It will command toga power. If you remove your auto thrust system indefinitely, you do not have that, right? But let's say, you see, your energy state is a function of your FAC computer, flight augmentation computer. So if your FAC computer is inaccurately predicting a low energy state, you may get alpha floor being commanded. So FAC computes erroneously a low energy state. That triggers the auto thrust system to command an alpha floor. You remove the alpha floor. How do you get out of alpha floor? By the way, alpha floor, it'll first say alpha floor, and then it's going to basically go into toga lock. And toga lock is always a, a byproduct of alpha floor. So your FMA will read A dot floor. Do I still have it up here? My FMA, right? You're going to see A floor. Lower the angle of attack. The second you lower the angle of attack, it goes into toga lock. How do you get out of toga lock? You just disconnect the instinctive disconnect push button. Or you can come back to idle, basically bringing the, uh, the auto thrust out of the active range. Thrust lever's at idle. It's out of the active range. You could certainly do that. But I, I wouldn't advise that because think about the whole reason that you are even in alpha floor to begin with. Because you have, well, assuming it's an accurate uh, prediction that you're going to be in a low energy state. If I'm in a low energy state, I probably don't want idle thrust. So I'm always an advocate of just hitting the instinctive disconnect push button. So you hit it, you get out of it. And now, yet again, let's go IDP off. IDP. So we remove the alpha floor. The fact erroneous, erroneously, yet again, predicts that you are in a low energy state, commands the auto thrust to give you alpha floor, which gives you toga lock and you disconnect the toga lock by the instinctive disconnect push button and the FAC erroneously again loops back the auto thrust into alpha floor. This is an alpha floor loop where you basically have an erroneous input that you are in a low energy state and you're not. How do you get out of this toga power, toga power, toga power, toga power? How do you stop it from going toga power, toga power, toga power? Okay, The way to stop it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the children of all ages, push and hold the instinctive disconnect push button for 15 seconds. Removes the auto thrust system entirely, and now alpha floor cannot be triggered because auto thrust isn't available. Makes sense? El zorro piloto! Dímelo! What's going on, baby? What do we got on... Uh, I'm checking the YouTube real quick, guys. If you look at me... If you look at me over here, let me see what questions we got coming in. Engine fire. No, we're good. You can keep autopilot on, disconnecting auto throttle. Okay, I'll address that. Um, I don't know what your name is. 9876543467890. <laughs> we'll address it. Okay, we'll address it. Um, so, anyway, hopefully that gives you some clarity on that. Now, I, I want to talk about. Can you, Shally, in that cabinet, there's an, a QRH. It's a. Okay. It's a Quick reference yeah. handbook. Shally's going to become a pilot, you see, as long as she, <laughs> she just keeps listening to these live streams and stuff. There's a thick book. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Throw it on the camera for the effect. Bam! <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So look, there is a checklist here. I'm moving on to the, um, uh, to the engine failure question that I got yesterday via the Instagram direct message function. Somebody sent me a message. And they asked, what happens... If we lose, <laughs> it's a crazy question. What happens if we lose both engines at V1? Well, good luck. So you're having a bad day. That's what happened. If you lose both engines at V1, you're having a bad day. Um, in all honesty, folks, what, what, it's just, it, it, what can I really say? I mean, I mean, you're not going to go flying. I mean, you could, right? And just bleed off whatever energy you have, and then that's it. You're, you're going to be out of energy, and you're not going to fly anymore. Probably the better thing to do is if, you, if they both fail at V1, just stop <laughs> as much as you can. You may, maybe you slide off the end of the runway, but uh, I, I mean, what can you do? If you lose both, you're not flying without any thrust, folks. You're just not going to fly. Now, the other thing he asked was about a low-altitude loss of thrust, and this is like what happened to, uh, what is this flight? 1549, US Air 1549. Uh, they took off from LaGuardia, had the loss of thrust on both engines. This was an A320, and they actually 
um, glided into the Hudson River. So let's dissect that. I'm going to dissect it on both airplanes. Uh, I'll stick to the 320 for a minute, and then I'm going to go to the 73. I've got the QRH, and I want to talk to you about what happened there. So if you take off and you have a loss of thrust on both engines on an A320, a couple of things. Number one, the ram air turbine is going to deploy. Now, why would the rat deploy the ram air turbine? Because the conditions for the ram air tur turbine deployment is airborne airspeed 100 plus knots. If you're climbing out, is my airspeed 100 plus knots? Yeah, for sure. And if I lose AC bus 1 plus 2 with the condition of 100 plus knots, the ram air turbine will deploy. Now, that's good news, and it's good news for two reasons. Because now I get 5 kVA, 5 volts, which is, which is uh, uh, 5 kVA is not a lot. The generator is typically providing 90, so you're not really getting a whole lot. You're getting 85 kVA less. But you are, even more importantly, getting 2,500 psi to the blue hydraulic system. And that is the most important thing. And the reason it is is because now you have flight controls. If I have, see, typically we have a green system and a yellow system. It's a quick little system review. Green system, yellow system, 3,000 PSI, right? They're both coming off of an engine-driven pump, typically. If you lose both engines, unlike the Boeing, there is no manual reversion, meaning there's no cables, there's no pulleys, there's no manual system for controlling your flight controls. You need hydraulics in an A320 to, to maneuver the elevators, the ailerons, the roll spoilers, the rudder. You need hydraulic pressure. So the ram air turbine deploys, you get 2,500 PSI, and at least now you're not a lawn dart, you can control the thing, right? And this is how they were able to maybe quote unquote dead stick it into the uh, Hudson River. Um, if you've actually read through some of the transcripts of that and you've looked at some of the reporting that came out about that, um, you'll notice that the starting of the APU was like number 15 on the list. And of course, you have an ECAM in a 320, so the ECAM pops up, and the ECAM has three different levels, level one, level two, level three, level one being like a fire, level three being something that doesn't require immediate priority, and it's going to prioritize based on the level of message that appears, what needs to appear first, right? What, what, what action needs to be taken first? And certainly, it didn't deem appropriate to start the APU as the most immediate thing, but out of purely experience, uh, Sully came in and said, hey, go ahead and start the APU. And he instructed uh, Jeff Skiles, his first officer, to do that, which was a great call, by the way, for him to do that. Not only because when the APU comes on, you no longer have 5 kVA, you now have 90 kVA because the APU gives you 90 kVA. But then also in addition to that, you have, very important, a ram air, not a ram air, a pneumatic, a bleed air source to start engines. You have a pneumatic bleed air source to start engines, which transitions me now into the loss of thrust on both engines, low altitude on a 737. Let's talk about that, because there is a checklist for it, but, and I'm actually here in the QRH. I have it open. I'm going to take you through it, but I want to share with you why this QRH, in my opinion, is not designed for a loss of thrust on both engines at low altitude. It is designed for high altitude, and we're going to look at that. So let's say now this is no longer a 320, right? Just to recap, we're, we're, before I move on, 100 knots, loss of AC bus 1 and 2, the ram air turbine comes out. I have blue hydraulic pressure, 20, 2,500 PSI. Hopefully you get the APU on. That's the number one takeaway if you, if you are taking notes from this thing. Put the APU on so that you have... A, uh, a AC power source that's greater than 5 kVA. And even more important now, you have a bleed air source that will allow you to crank the engines, okay? To crank an engine, you need rotation. To achieve rotation, you need air. It will be either ram air or it will be bleed air, but you need air, folks. You've got to have air. So the reason, as I'm going to get to in just a second, that you're going to see what this QRH is, the way to rotate an engine is a bleed air source from an APU, another engine from a cross bleed start, or perhaps a start cart, right, at the gate. Or if you have enough altitude, you can trade altitude for airspeed and dive and get sufficient rotation to start the engine. But of course, here, we're talking low altitude, and that's not one of the luxuries we have. So let's now transition 
into the 737 question and G, which is what happens if I lose thrust on both engines and I'm at a low altitude? Well, let's first look at the flight controls. Let me back up. Let's first look at the electrical uh, source, right? Then we'll look at the flight controls and we'll see how this thing plays out. You will um, lose generator one, generator two. Right, because here's number one engine, here's number two engine, loss, loss, boom, boom. Okay, so you lose both engines. This number one engine has a engine driven pump, number two has an engine driven pump, number one engine powers AC bus one, number two powers AC bus two, which powers effectively two electric pumps. These pumps will run our flight control system, system A and system B. Uh, assuming we still have a little bit of rotation, we'll probably still get a little bit of pressure out of these engine-driven pumps. So you'll still have flight controls. In worst case, of course, even in, the th in a 7.3, you have manual reversion. So I guess what I'm getting at is you have flight controls. You will be able to fly. That's the good news. The downside is there's no memory item for this. There is a checklist. I'm going to take you through it, and then I'm going to share with you why this is designed for high altitude, which is what I was saying earlier. Loss of thrust on both engines, QRH. Uh, condition, both of these occur, and uh, both engines have lost, have a loss of thrust. You're having a bad day. Both engines have a loss of thrust. Look, if you have a loss of thrust on both engines, uh, 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 you're able to dead stick it, you survive the thing, I would tell you, go buy a lottery ticket, man, because it's, uh, the, the chance of having a loss of thrust on both engines is well, it doesn't happen frequently. I guess it did happen for the 1549, but fortunately it doesn't happen frequently. So engine start levers, both uh, engine start switches first, flight. So we go to flight. Both start switches go to flight. When you put both start switches to flight, what happens? Your igniters, these engines have two igniters, a left igniter and a right igniter. The igniters will begin firing on both. By the way, the 320 has igniters too. The igniters will begin uh, uh, firing on both, regardless of the position of the engine ignition select switch. And if you're looking at an overhead panel, you'll see exactly what I mean. But basically, whether you're selected on the left or the right igniter, when you put the switches to flight, you will get continuous ignition on both of these igniters. Engine start levers both cut off, and then you raise them back up to the idle detent when the EGT decreases. Engine start levers cut off, and then idle detent. What does that do? This closes the engine fuel valve, bringing them to cutoff, and when you raise them, it will open the engine uh, uh, fuel valve. In addition to opening and closing of the fuel valve, the engine start lever also controls the ignition circuit. In other words, this igniter will not fire unless the engine start lever is in the idle detent. So you have to bring the engine start lever to cutoff, close the fuel shutoff valve, cut off the ignition circuit, raise the engine start lever back to the idle detent, open the fuel valve, and re, hopefully, re-engage the igniters here. If they weren't firing, you're kind of doing a little reset there. Uh, Carlos, I'm going to answer your question, brother. I see it there. Um, and hopefully you can get some ignition out of this engine. Now, here's where it really starts to get interesting. I'm going to keep reading down. If EGT reaches 950 or there's no increase in EGT within 30 seconds, engine start lever confirm cutoff, and then you raise back to the idle detent. So you have to bring it up to the idle detent. You're timing 30 seconds. And if in 30 seconds you don't see any EGT increase, then you're going to do the same procedure again. By the way, all the while, you got a pilot flying that is making sure we're headed towards a suitable landing point. Step five, at or above. This is the part where I say, man, this checklist is designed for a loss of thrust on both engines at altitude. It is not designed for a loss of thrust on both engines low. At or above flight level 270. Well, let's think about that. At or above, let's draw way up here because you're way up flying high in the sky, boy. 270. Okay, you're up here cruising along. At or above. Set airspeed to 275. Set airspeed to 275. Now, if I don't have any thrust, the only way to get 275 knots is to trade altitude for speed, which means you're going to descend now, right? Below 270, below 270, set airspeed to 300 knots. So if you're down here, 
you're going to dive even more aggressively, and you're going to go to 300 knots. Now, if you just took off, I preferably do not want to dive for 275 or 300 knots. In this case, you're below 27, right? So I'm not going to dive for 300 knots because I'm giving away all of my landing options. And really, the reason you're giving them away is because this checklist assumes you're at altitude and it's having you get an air source to rotate the engine for a relight. To start an engine, what do I need? I need fuel, I need air, I need ignition. Let's check each one off. Engine start switches, flight. That's my ignition part. Okay, engine start levers both cut off and then you raise them back up when the EGT de decreases to the idle detent. When I bring them down to the cutoff position, I close the fuel shutoff valve. When I raise them up, I open the fuel shutoff valve and I begin the ignition circuit. So this is also a second check mark for the ignition and we're getting the fuel valves to recycle. So now I have the ignition taken care of, I've got the fuel taken care of, then the QRH proceeds to tell us if we're below 27 to dive 300 knots because this 300 knots gives me engine rotation which is trying to solve the final piece of the puzzle to crank an engine which is I need air. And when you lose thrust on both engines at low altitude, unfortunately you do not have the luxury of diving 300 knots because you need whatever altitude you have to find a suitable landing point. So the question for you now is what would you do to solve the air problem. You're not going to dive. You don't have cross bleed capability because the engines are off. What other onboard pneumatic source do we have that can solve the air problem? Okay? The answer is the APU. The answer is the APU. The APU can solve the air problem. So what am I saying? If you lose thrust on both engines at low altitude, the immediate thing is start the APU. You have got to solve the air problem. Well, the immediate thing is fly the plane. Aviate, navigate, communicate, right? Let's back up to private pilot training. Fly the plane, aviate, navigate, communicate, look for a suitable landing point, and then with whatever time you have, get the APU started. Now the APU, dependent upon elevation, takes anywhere between 60 seconds, that's a minute, to two minutes to start. Certainly no more than two minutes, typically. So as soon as you get the APU on, now what do we do? Okay, Joe, we got the APU running, now what do we do? Well, you're going to basically try to crank the engine the same way you would crank it on the ground. How do you start an engine on the ground? Number one, you turn the packs off. Right? These are the pack switches. Those of you that fly the 737NG, think about starting an engine on the ground. What do you do? APU bleed on, left pack off, right pack off. Two switches on the overhead panel, right over the first officer's head, right? A APU bleed on and the two packs off. The second you turn the packs off, you have full APU pressure available to the engine start valve. You bring the start switch out of the flight detent. You move it to the ground detent, which opens the start valve. Think about what we're doing now. We got the APU going. We got engine over here. Start valve is tied to the placing of the engine start switch into the ground position. Despite the fact that the checklist said to put it into the flight position, the reason it said put it in flight is to solve the ignition problem. Guess what? The ground position also gives me ignition. So I'm going to solve the ignition problem. I got an air source from an APU check. Start valve's turning at 25% and 2, just like if you were on the ground, engine start lever, you're going to raise it up to the idle detent, and hopefully you can start at least one engine the way that you would typically start it on the ground and have enough altitude to spool it up, at least maintain altitude, and then recover and climb. Is this in a checklist anywhere? No. This is nowhere in a checklist. Joe's making stuff up. You're absolutely right. Where did Joe get it from? Joe got it from trying this scenario in a sim, and this is the only thing that I found because I methodically broke it down as I did with you here, and I'm like, okay, what is this QRH trying to have me do? It's trying to give me a fuel source, an air source, and an ignition source, and the problem is the air source 
their solution is to dive. And if you're at low altitude, you can't. So, <clears throat> all right, hopefully that, um, hopefully that makes sense to you all. Let me see what I got on Instagram for a second. Uh, Carlos, good question. When we have an engine fire and we are going to use the APU bleed, we will have a limitation with it depending on the engine. If it's engine one, we can't use it. If it's engine two, we can use it. Yes, you are right, Carlos. And I'm guessing you fly the A320 because that uh, is an A320 limitation. So, hey, hopefully this made sense to you that we're following with the 7.3 discussion. Drop your comments in the, in, the, uh, in the chat there. I'll go through them really quick, and we'll kind of address what, what have you, you know. But uh, let, me ju let me just address this real quick with Carlos. So look, Carlos, um, you have engine number one supplying APU, uh, I'm sorry, supplying bleed air. You have an APU supplying bleed air, and you have engine number two supplying bleed air. Now, I always remember, one by one, two by two. Those of you that are 320 drivers, here it is. One by one and two by two. What does that mean, Joe? If you push the number one fire push button, you have one action to take, which is to shut the cross bleed. If you push the number two fire push button, you have two actions to take, if desired. Always shut the cross bleed and then put the APU bleed on. Now, the, the whole reason behind this is because, let's think about that for a second. If number uh, two engine is severely damaged, it is thought that perhaps the bleed ducting is contaminated. So what I want to do is shut the cross bleed Make sure that this is shut. And if desired, you can utilize the APU bleed to provide the pneumatic source. And that will offload because one of the functions of the 320 is when you put the APU bleed on, the engine bleeds close automatically, unlike our 7.3 compadres, okay? So now this bleed closes. I now have APU bleed supplying. The number one engine is relieved from a pneumatic load, and I have more available thrust. So, one by one, two by two. If the number two engine fails due to severe damage, there is a potential for uh, pneumatic ducting contamination. I do not want the, contaminate, the contaminant to cross-contaminate into the opposite side. We shut the cross bleed via the rotary select switch. If desired, and if you need additional engine thrust, you can put on the APU bleed, which will effectively close the engine number one bleed, offloading it of its bleed demand, and now I have additional engine one thrust. Now, that's the two by two. If you do one by one, that's because number one engine failed. Now the number one engine has failed. The number one APU, um, not APU, excuse me, but the number one engine bleed ducting is said to potentially be contaminated. We, of course, don't want it to cross-contaminate it over here to number two, so what do we do? We do close the cross bleed, but we don't open the APU. We must keep this closed. That's why there's only one action to take, which is close the cross bleed. That's the common one, universal, always close it, because the APU bleed ducting and the engine number one bleed ducting are on the same side of the cross bleed, so they're on a common manifold, so to speak, and they could actually end up, you could end up contaminating the APU bleed ducting if you tried to put the APU bleed on and the contamination is on the number one side. So, Carlos, you're right, and um, you want to... Make sure you don't contaminate your APU duct, brother. But you always close the cross bleed, and 
just a little memory aid, one by one and two by two. If the number one fails, one action to take, close a cross bleed. If the number two fails, two actions to take, close a cross bleed. And if desired, you can turn the APU bleed on. Hopefully that helps. George, what's going on? He's watching me live. He's watching me live. Luckily, Sully had an Airbus, loss of both engines. Uh, yeah, it probably would have been another story with a 7.3. You're right. You're right, brother. Who else is asking me questions here? What's going on, guys? Drop your questions in chat. Hopefully, you're liking the live stream on both Instagram and YouTube. I got YouTube over here. Why turning the APU is not the priority is per the QRH if that solves the problem. Giant. Great question. Why not turn the APU on? Why is that not the priority, he asks, if that solves the problem? Because we don't have... Um, a QRH that assumes the loss of altitude, I'm sorry, that assumes the loss of the thrust is at low altitude. See, that's the problem, Giant. Hopefully I'm saying your name right, brother. I'm sorry if I'm not. Um, but this QRH does not assume, this assumes that it's at high altitude. We don't have a procedure that assumes loss of thrust on both engines at low altitude. We simply don't have it. Now, we're always training for V1 cut, but we're never training for a V1 loss of thrust on both engines. I mean, we just don't train for that. Um, so try it one time if you're in a sim and you have some extra time. Um, you know, maybe it'd be something for you to try. You're probably not going to get turned back to the airport unless you're at least at probably 2,500, 3,000 feet. I've done it in a sim. I, I had to um, initiate the loss of thrust on both engines around 3,000 feet, at which point I was able to make a turn. And... I was able to uh, make it back to the reciprocal runway. By the way, by the way, I want to ask you this question. Uh, the typical G load, or I should say the maximum G load attainable in a transport category jet should never exceed what? It should never exceed what? Carlos, thanks Joe, got it one by one, two by two. You got it brother, glad that helps. In a turn, in a transport category jet, you should never exceed how many Gs? How many Gs should we never exceed? Drop it in comments. Did you guys know I'm a drummer? That's why, like, if you see me flipping markers and doing all kinds of crazy tapping and whatever. I've been playing drums since I was four, man. 24. 24 years I've been playing. I'm going on 28 now. Leonidas, 2.5. You are correct. And the winner of a brand new Mercedes Benz and a free trip to Hawaii. Although I don't think who's flying is maybe there's some flights going to Hawaii right now with COVID. I don't know. All right, so 2.5 G's. You never want to exceed 2.5 G's. The Airbus will not allow you to exceed 2.5 G's in normal law. Actually, also in alternate law and even in abnormal attitude law. For more information on laws, go to One Step Prep. Dot com. We got a whole course for you there on laws, okay? So 2.5 Gs. You can't exceed it in a protected airplane. Now, on a, on a 7.3, which is not protected, right? You could pull more than 2.5 Gs, but the reason 2.5 Gs is important is because 14 CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 25, which is Transport Category Jet Certification. This is where the governing authority, the FAA, they say... A transport category jet must be able to depart and have engine failure at V1 at max gross takeoff weight and continue to climb and meet second segment climb. It lays that out in 14 CFR part 25. A transport category jet must be able to pull at least 2.5 G's at most and remain structurally intact. Okay, so that's where I'm, where I'm pulling all this stuff from. So 2.5 G's. So now the next question then is, at what speed? At what speed is 2.5 G's attainable? Now, it's not a trick question. 
the 2.5 G's is attainable at green dot. Green dot is a term for the 320. It's literally on the speed tape. And I think actually on a 7.3, certainly the classic, I think the NG, I'm not too sure. I think I got to... I think I would have to double check that, but I think the NG also has a green dot. The green dot is representative of VA, or maneuvering speed. At maneuvering speed, that is the speed where you could turn and hold 2.5 Gs and maintain altitude. If you drop, so typically, by the way, that number is somewhere around 205 knots, something like that. So what happens, Joe, if, uh, if I slow down to like 190 knots or 180 knots, I thought if I go slower, my turn is tighter. Well, there is some truth to that. You just won't be able to pull two and a half Gs, right? Because what will happen is if you don't have enough speed, if you're slow at 180 and you crank in a turn and pull, 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 you're loading the airfoil, you're loading the wing now, you will actually stall the wing before you get to 2.5 G's. Does that make sense? If you're too slow, try this in a, if you have a desktop sim, try it. If you have some extra time in a sim, try it. But certainly don't try it in the airplane, okay? But if you can roll at 180 knots and pull and try to get to 2.5 G's, you will not get there because you will stall before you get to 2.5 G's. Now, the reverse of that would be, well, what if I speed up? What if I go to 220 knots and try to pull that? Well, at 220 knots, same amount of force, you would actually end up over 2.5 Gs. You would be overstressing. And so the green dot, or the maneuvering speed, is the speed at which you will be able to uh, maintain 2.5 Gs and maintain constant altitude. That is EEC, or not EEC, EET. Got too many acronyms, man. We got acronyms galore in this business. You ever thought that? I've always thought, what business do you know that has more acronyms than aviation? My wife is a nurse. They've got acronyms, but man, they can't compete with us. We got so many acronyms, I don't even know what all these acronyms are. They just fly around EEC and EET and FADEC and acronyms all over. EET is... Um, Extended Envelope Training, otherwise known as another acronym, wait for it, UPRT, or Upset Prevention and Recovery Training. Shelly, how many acronyms do we have in aviation? <laughs> we got acronyms here until Christmas time. Acronyms, acronyms. Leonidas, what do we got going on? Let me see. Uh, how can you get the bus... We'll probably just wrap it up pretty soon. How can you get the bus to fly like a Boeing? Shouldn't you get it to direct pitch, direct roll, <laughs> and alternate yaw? I've seen this only possible when the landing gear down. Both RAs have failed. Okay, let's, uh, well, let's expand that. Okay, good question. The way the Boeing, let me back up. The way the Boeing flies for flight controls is if you deflect the elevator 10%, or if you deflect the column 10%, the elevator deflects 10%. If you direct an aileron 20%, the aileron, or the, uh, the flight control, the column specifically, should direct 20%. So in other words, the column deflection is directly related to the elevator or the aileron deflection. Not the case in the 320. So now Leonidas asks, well, how do we get it to do that? And the answer is basically you need to get the, the pitch Oh, and the roll to be in a direct relationship. The pitch and the roll must be in a direct relationship. So the question you're really asking is, how do I get the pitch and the roll into a direct relationship? And the answer is to go into direct law. How do I go into direct law? You said it. You must first be in alternate law, plus the gear must be down, plus the autopilot must be off. If all three of these are true, alternate law plus gear down plus autopilot off, I will go into direct law and indirect law. The pitch control is a direct communication, side stick to elevator, and the roll control is a direct communication, side stick to aileron. 
you're flying a 7.3, you're flying a 172, you're back into flying a Boeing, okay? Now, the other thing you mentioned is the RA. You are right, sir. If both radio altitudes fail, radio altimeters, you will default straight to direct law. You'll skip all this. You don't need alternate plus gear down plus autopilot off. No, 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 no. If both radio, alt uh, radio altimeters fail, you will instantly go... That was a loud snap. Can you guys snap? If both... Uh, if both... Uh, RAs fail, you will go straight into direct law and you are effectively now flying a Boeing. Super pitchy! Uh, go check out the stall video. Those of you that are members of OneStepPrep.com for the A320 program, we just uploaded a brand new stall video. It's uh, eight minutes long. I do the stall recovery. I'm seated there in the seat and I do the stall recovery and I narrate the whole thing. I talk the whole way through it and you'll notice it's extremely sensitive. Very, very, very pitchy in all axes and you actually see me saying don't stir the pot which basically means <laughs> don't stir it don't 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 over control i'm fly flying with my fingertips basically um and so um it's just very pitchy man unlike the 7-3 where yes you have a direct communication but it's not as pitchy and by the way the reason it's not as pitchy or as roll sensitive is because we have something called a elevator feel computer which takes hydraulic system A and B pressure and it takes the air sensed in the pitot tubes on the vertical stabilizer in the back and based on ram air sensing, right, sensitivity, if you're flying quickly, it stiffens the control column and if you're flying slowly, it relaxes it, much like your car. City driving, easy to steer. Highway driving, a little bit stiffer, right? Same concept the elevator feel computer will do that for you on a 7.3, so it doesn't feel as sensitive and as touchy, uh, but you're still very much so in what we would call a quote-unquote direct communication like you would be in direct law with the Airbus. Okay, so hopefully, Leonidas, that answers your question. One more question. Engine fire. You keep your autopilot engaged or disconnect with the auto throttle. Talking about the 737NG. You can keep your autopilot on if you're flying single engine. That's true on 7.3 and the 320. You can keep your autopilot on, okay? The auto throttle on the 737 will come off. You will turn it off. The memory item tells you to turn it off, and the QRH will tell you to turn it off, but the autopilot is available. But one thing I want to tell you, please keep this in mind, guys. The autopilot on the 737 is only two axis. It will control pitch, it will control roll, it will not control yaw. The autopilot on the 737 does not control yaw. The reason I emphasize this so much is because I see a lot of times in sims, people will put the autopilot on, they'll let go of the rudder pedals. And of course now the airplane's yawing all over the place. I have a video about this on YouTube. So keep in mind that your autopilot will not control the yaw axes and therefore you must keep your feet on the rudder pedals all the time. On the A320, uh, it will control yaw. Such a beautiful machine, that 320. It will control yaw. From the second you put the autopilot on, it will be controlling pitch, roll, and the yaw axis. The rudder trims for you. It's just, it's, it's, the V1 cuts are a lot simpler in a, in a 320 than on the, um, than on the 737, okay? So look, hopefully you guys have enjoyed the live stream. I don't even know how long we've been on. I think we've been on for at least 45 minutes or so. Uh, Leonidas, well, okay, thank you, but what about the opposite? If I turn on the control wheel steering on the Boeing MCP, will it fly like a bus? Yeah, it'll fly like a bus. He's bringing up a good point. Look, the Airbus, uh, see you guys, I'll be here all day long, man. I'll just be answering stuff all day long. Okay, and with that, let me share something with you. On, in, on December, we don't have the link for this yet, but in December, in December, we're doing two days. Uh, Juan is gonna do day one, I'm gonna do day two. We're doing a 737 course and an A320 course for eight hours. Interactive, virtual, much like what we're doing right here. And here's the best part. It is $97.
What? We're just giving stuff away up in here, man. 97 bucks. So we're going to do a two-day course, eight hours a day. It'll be a Friday and a Saturday. Block your whole day out, Friday and Saturday. And we're going to do a thorough systems review. Juan and myself will be here. JD himself, he will be here. Uh, he's going to take you primarily through the systems. I am going to take you primarily through the automation, uh, the profiles and the automation. Uh, I see Instagram has me on a timer, 17 seconds remaining. If you're watching on Instagram and you want to continue watching, go to the YouTube channel and you can watch us uh, there where they don't time us. Okay, so two days, mid-December, date to be announced. It will be $97 and you will spend two days with us, 16 hours. Now, let me go back to this here, Leonidas, about control wheel steering. Control wheel steering on the Boeing will fly much like the Airbus does. What does that mean? That basically means if you put it in a roll of 10 degrees, it'll hold 10 degrees. If you put it in a nose up 10 degrees pitch, it'll hold a nose up 10 degrees pitch. That's control wheel steering. How often do we ever do that in the 7.3? Frankly, never. Uh, never in my experience. Perhaps anybody watching this that is a 7.3 driver that feels otherwise, please let me know. But uh, I've never had a, a, re, a realistic time or place or use to use control wheel steering in a 737. The Airbus is an interesting thing. Like I said, if this is your attitude indicator and you put this, this jet in a 10 degree bank, it's going to hold 10 degrees. Because why? Typically we're in G load and roll rate. So if I command a roll and I get to 10 degrees and let go, it's just going to hold 10 degrees, right? If I command uh, a positive G change that's nose up and let go, it's going to nose up and then it's going to hold whatever it's at. So if, if it's at a positive 5 or a positive 10 degrees, it's just going to hold that, right? The uh, 737, on the other hand, is different, right? It has an elevator back here. So when you pull on that column and you're commanding a nose up elevator, the second you release, the elevator goes back to a neutral position and it's not looking to maintain a constant pitch. It's actually looking to maintain a constant elevator position based on what you have in the control column input. So, that is the difference. That is the difference. Control wheel steering will fly like the bus to answer your question, Leonidas. We just don't frequently use it. Okay, a lot of other questions coming through here. Maybe I'll pick one or two and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, what does a yaw damper do in the 737? Prevents Dutch roll. Uh, that's kind of an explanation a little bit longer beyond the scope of this feed. But it maintains coordinated flight, coordinated turns, and prevents uh, Dutch roll. How many times I have to use a QRH in case of a dual hydraulic failure? Once. There's a uh, chapter 13 is hydraulics, loss of uh, system A and system B. It's a checklist here. You just go through it one time. Can you please explain cost index? I'm a commercial pilot. Cost index is how efficient do you want this is something that your airline assigns the cost index is a number between zero and 99 99 is fly fast zero is fly slow if you're on time we typically fly somewhere in the middle 35 okay this number is basically to tell the engines do we want to burn a lot of fuel and get there quickly, or do we want to burn minimal fuel and get there slower? Your airline computes this number based on other cost factors that are associated with the flight. That include the cost of the flight crew, pilot, flight attendant, the fuel, the catering, uh, the dispatchers that are on, on stations, on duty, right? The entire, what does it cost to operate that flight? And then we can play with this number to dictate how much revenue we generate out of that flight based on the fuel burn. Do we want to get there faster or slower? We'll play with this number depending upon are we delayed. If we are, we want to get there back, we want to get back on time. Maybe we speed it up, go to 99. Can't go any faster than that. Or if you're, if you're maybe you're way ahead of schedule and you want to slow down, save some money, you can bring it back to zero. So that's something that your dispatcher will assign, your airline will assign to you. Tosin, engine failure on the go around. Um, I have a whole video on that actually on YouTube, Tosin. So I would just go to one of our most recent update uh, uploads, and I talk about the engine failure on go around. 
uh, it's also inside the course and um, uh, I'm just uh, I'm going to direct you to do that because I think a lot of the questions you may have are covered there and this live stream has been going on for quite some time already so I'm going to probably cut it so that um, we can get people uh, getting on with their day and all that so hey I hope you found value in this stream we'll continue to do more mid-December look for a announcement to come out shortly I want to one of the things I love doing most, I got to tell you this real quick, guys. Uh, in December, there's a lot of things going on. Obviously, it's Christmas time. Holidays are coming. Um, but I've, I've, I'm humbled because I've actually been hired by an airline to go out to them and teach 40 of their instructors, 4-0, 40 of their instructors on how to teach. In other words, they... they they thought so much of my instruction that they said, well, come out and teach our instructors on how to instruct. And so I'm humbled by that. And um, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm pleased and humbled that they thought so highly of my instruction. And I just want to say, if, if any of you that are maybe associated with that carrier, because I know some of you watch this, I appreciate you all. And everybody watching this, I appreciate you all. Really, I do. I cannot tell you how much. Um, your support and you being here and just just sharing your irreplaceable time with me on this is definitely uh, appreciated so I want to thank you guys um, for being here and like I said I'm humbled so in December I'm going to be doing that and also in December right around the same time mid-December we'll be doing this two days uh, it's 97 bucks uh, we don't have the purchase link yet, but we're going to be putting that together. That's my next project once we wrap this up. We're going to be putting together a landing a, a page for you to actually go to and the link for you to enroll in this. The dates are probably mid-December, first, uh, first and second week. We're doing a 737 and an A320 course. I hope to see you there. Um, it's been tough to get people here in person because of the COVID situation, but certainly we have plenty of cameras and microphones and TV so we can do all these things virtually. We can interact with you as you're seeing here. And we're going to do a Zoom meeting two days in a row, eight hours each day. They are long days. Those of you that have never done airline style training, they're long days. We cover a lot of material. Uh, you'll take plenty of notes. JD will be here. Uh, actually right now he's in New York doing a maintenance training. But he will be here in December for this, and he's going to be doing a thorough systems review on the 7.3, also on the 3.20, and then I'm going to come in either on second half of day one, certainly on day two, and spend another eight hours with you going through profiles, FMAs, call-outs, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. So I hope you guys uh, join us for that. All right. Thanks again. I see you all uh, uh, thanking me. No, thank you, man. I appreciate you all. I really do. And we'll see you in the next feed. If you're not uh, at, uh, one of our members, go to onestepprep.com. Certainly join there. Um, and um, if you're not on our email news list, our blast list, you can also just drop your, that's a free thing. Just go to onestepprep.com. Drop an email there because typically almost every other day, if not every day, certainly every other day, we're shooting out emails with content. So appreciate you all. Have an awesome day. Have an awesome weekend. Have an awesome 2020. Despite all the chaos that's going on, it will pass. It has to. It's the world we live in. It's transitory, folks. Everything is here and it's gone. Everything passes, so enjoy the ride. I'll see you on the next stream, and hopefully I'll see you in December at our live two-day course.